From Forbes.com, Eric Moo, contributor, writes, why there should be a Bitcoin central bank. Uh-oh. Someone doesn't understand the problem of central banks or the benefit of Bitcoin. Or, or does he? Let's get into this. It's a little interesting. It is no secret that today almost all modern banks operate on the basis of fractional reserves. To put in simpler terms, banks only have in their vaults a small percentage of the money that their customers gave them. If too large a number of customers of a specific bank want to get their money back at the same time, the bank wouldn't be able to satisfy the demand. Before there was a modern central bank system, the bank would either have to borrow the funds from elsewhere or file for bankruptcy. The central banks, in theory, have an infinite ability to lend by conjuring up money from thin air because they're backed by government regulation rather than a commodity like gold or silver. <laughs> backed by government regulation. No, you can't back a currency with government regulation. You can back it with the promise that the government is going to steal from people some more. That's different. That the government is going to keep violently forcing people to use this money and keep their monopoly going. Yes. All right, but I want to take a step back here and explain for people that aren't familiar with this kind of banking theory. Yeah, we're going to have fun tonight about fa fractional reserve banking and why it's, it's hypothetically fine, but there's a problem with it when you introduce this, this central bank idea and the, 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 the backstop to it. Now, this, people like to explain this theory as coming from the goldsmiths who had in their vault a certain amount of gold and you could come and give them your gold and they would hold it for you in safekeeping, and they would give you a certificate for it. And then people would trade these gold certificates because it was easier than trading physical gold. Makes sense, right? And then some of the goldsmiths got carried away and issued more certificates than they had gold in their vaults. Now, if you're doing that and you're saying this is redeemable for a piece of gold, then you're committing fraud if you don't have the gold to redeem it. Now, they could get away with this because, as Mr. Moo points out, that you know, if not too large a number of customers of a specific bank or goldsmith didn't want to get all of their money or gold back at the same time, then there's never a problem and they're able to get away with this. And there are banks that now they do this basically in the open. And it's, you know, it's on public record, it's in their books. This is how we do fractional reserve banking. And it's important to point out that a lot of libertarians rail against the Federal Reserve System and don't really understand that most of the money that is created in the system is not created by the Federal Reserve, and, and at least not directly, but is created by this idea of fractional reserve lending. And the reserve rates are extremely low under American banking regulations. And the reason banks are able to get away with this is because they have the central bank, as he points out, backing them up. Now, the problem with this is that if a bank is failing and the central bank backs them up by creating more money out of thin air, printing it or digitally creating it and giving it to them, then it is ripping off everybody else in the system who is forced to use this money because their money loses value. Supply and demand applies to the medium of exchange as much as anything else. You have more dollars out in the economy, in the market, chasing the same number of scarce goods and services, then the prices are going to go up. That's inflation. It is literally the inflating of the money supply. It's not price inflation. Price inflation is a consequence of monetary inflation, which is really the core ripoff of the system. More money is created by banks that goes into the hands of bankers, that goes to their power and everybody else, especially those on fixed incomes or you know, uh, you know, hourly wages, we lose out. So the Bitcoin world doesn't have a central bank and this fact actually appeals to some of its supporters with libertarian inclinations. Now, if I may just as an aside, Mr. Moo here, what is a libertarian inclination? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what libertarian means. And if, like I, you believe that libertarian means belief in freedom, and you understand that freedom is based on self-ownership, you as a free, beautiful, independent human being own yourself, that is therefore morally wrong to use force or coercion against you, then libertarian inclinations are those you know, looking for peace and nonviolence and respect for individual rights and property. I would hope that that would be, you know, synonymous with human inclinations, wanting to believe in freedom for everyone. All right. Among this group is a widely held belief that bailing out insolvent banks is no different than highway robbery. Well, it's like highway robbery, but it's a little, uh, little more 
deceptive and harder to see. I mean, the other nice thing about, uh, you know, a highway man versus uh, the government is that a highway man might put a gun in your face and take your money, but then he'll let you go and leave you alone. The government will keep stealing from you forever because they think it's for your own good and you've been tr tricked into believing it, or at least a critical mass of the population has. So, if a bank screws up, the argument maintains, it should face the consequences alone rather than shifting the burden to parties across the system in the form of debased per unit currency value. Per unit currency value, that is more currency is created, the average value of the currency, the purchasing power of that dollar goes down. So back to the goldsmith analogy, this is like if, if all the goldsmiths worked for the king and one goldsmith issued a bunch of certificates and then a bunch of his customers came and tried to redeem them at the same time and he said, oh crap, I don't have enough gold, I'm sorry. What would happen if there wasn't a king? He would go out of business, he would be ridiculed, he would be sued, he would be held accountable for the money that he owes people that he had essentially you know, created in the fraud of creating extra certificates. But in this analogy, the central bank is like a king who says, all right, you know what, that, that goldsmith, he's, he's, he needs help. I'm going to steal gold from all these peasants. I'm just going to steal some of these certificates back and give them to him. But as it really works with the central bank, the central bank just creates more money and gives it to the bank that is overextended and bails them out. However, without a central bank system, a fractional reserve system can be risky. That's the point. Now, a fractional reserve concept is, is okay in a free market if it's done openly and willingly, and it's a way of loaning people money where you're taking it out of their reserves, but they're maybe getting interest on it. And, and clearly, uh, Mr. Mu here understands some of this, but this is like, how do you want to reduce the risk? Do you want to reduce the risk by peaceful means of creating appropriate checks and balances in the market of people you know, going to banks that are going to not just risk their money recklessly? Or do you want to just be able to steal from everyone when someone gets a little irresponsible? This is illustrated by the many failed banks in history, and most recently, the spectacular fail of Mt. Gox. Okay, now you're going a little far, Mr. Moo, and really getting into some speculation and making some connections that aren't here. Before it became clear that the Bitcoin exchange was insolvent, users were trading under the false assumption that they were exchanging their own Bitcoins when the reality was that they were just trading in Gox coins, which is just thin air. Later, it was discovered that the exchange had lost tens of thousands of its customers' coins, and the cause remains a mystery to this day. Yeah, so it's a mystery. So it's not, it's not, it's not your, your apples and oranges here, sir. And when you're talking about the idea of, of Mt. Gox being a proof of your concept, this is, if, if all of the coins were stolen, which is the most likely scenario here, not that they were just magically lost, I mean, again, it's like the goldsmith taking gold out and just hoarding it. That's not a failure of, of the, the system. That's, that's just theft. So... The collapse of Mt. Gox has had great implications on the Bitcoin world. It shook many people's confidence in exchanges and the overall security in the digital currency. Yeah, but it shouldn't have. I mean, in exchanges, I mean, it's sort of like one exchange has a failure or is the victim of theft. Then, yeah, I mean, you might look a little more closely at other exchanges, but even the benefit of them is better than you know not using them at all for most people. So the security of the digital currency, no, not really. If you don't understand it, you might go, oh my God, an exchange failed. Bitcoin is not secure. But if you understand that Bitcoin is a decentralized cryptocurrency based on the blockchain, you understand that the failure of Mt. Gox doesn't threaten the security of Bitcoin itself at all. So, the collapse of Mt. Gox has had great implications on the Bitcoin world, blah, blah, blah. Inevitably, this was reflected in price levels and used by many Bitcoin critics. In fact, it's arguable that the psychological cost is even greater than the value of the lost Bitcoins. And it's true, it did have some shaking in the confidence there. And in the um, you know, Bitcoin market, we've seen appropriate corrections and you know, fail-safes and things coming in to compensate. And you know, when, when government has failures like this, when it has you know, runaway inflation, they just create more money and screw the economy up worse. And, and the, the advantage of not having a central bank is that you have the chance for market corrections, which is what we have seen in such a beautiful way with Bitcoin. In the aftermath, there was increasing demand for Bitcoin exchanges to have a 100% reserve ratio. In response, a cryptographic proof of reserve system was introduced to enable exchanges to prove that they can handle a Bitcoin version of a run on the bank. Last week, OKCoin, a China-based Bitcoin exchange, announced they had passed a proof of service reserve audit with its reserve right, ration. I, I believe this is ratio, not ration. Uh, and, and I would think that Forbes would have better spell checking. 
uh, for this or proofreading of 104.86%. That means that the exchange has 4.86% in excess of the amount it owes its customers. Well, this is insuring for OK coin customers. It may not be a good thing for Bitcoin if you treat it as an economy system. The benefit of fractional reserve banking is that it has positive effect on the economy by allowing banks to extend credit to people who are in need of it, provided the borrowers agree to pay back with an interest. Now, again, you're looking at the benefit without the cost here, and you're right that it's good that credit is possible, but when you don't have the system that is based on this kind of criminal underpinning of being able to steal from everybody to back up irresponsibility, then you have a different system of uh, determining how much is available. And this is a brilliant balance that the free market banking system would provide if it were allowed to function. Because savings, that is, if you save money, you put it in a bank and you say, bank, please loan this out to people with interest so that I can get some dividend on this. And you, know, you don't have to do fractional reserve. You can just take my money and loan it to people that you think are going to use it. Well, it's a great balance of you know, how much do we want to invest in future capital versus immediate consumption. Now, think about this for a second. If, say there's a natural disaster, and we don't want to save money right now. I want to take all my money out of the bank. I want to spend it on food and clothing and rebuilding my home. Wow. All right. Well, then I need that. And it wouldn't make sense in that kind of situation for the economy to say, yeah, but we need to be able to invest money in startups and new companies and new technologies that are going to bear fruit five to 10 years from now. However, this, in this, in this just brilliant function of this system, when people are, again, acting peacefully and not basing the system on theft, let's say, hey, there's no natural disaster. I'm sitting pretty. I got a little extra cash. I want to, you know, I want to watch it grow. I want to save it for a rainy day. I'm going to put it in the bank and let them give it to some startups and invest in cool stuff. And hey, I'll be able to buy a flying car in five to 10 years. Let's dedicate the resources to R&D and development of new technologies as opposed to immediate consumption. And that balance there, based on how much people put in savings in a system, is what then determines the interest rate and how much it costs to borrow money. So if, nobody, if, if banks don't have a lot of money in reserves and savings, then there's not a lot of money that's available for a borrower to borrow for a startup. And it's sending them the signal like, hey, the interest rate's going to be really high. Therefore, you shouldn't borrow that much money. Maybe you should focus on more immediate needs for people. And if, it's, if, if, there are, if people put a lot of savings into the system, then the interest rate comes down because a lot of people are putting their money in the bank saying, please invest this, please invest this. And then the bank is looking for investment opportunities and startups are encouraged and further technology development is encouraged. And so the interest rate is not sent by some arbitrary central authority. It's set by this natural balance of market forces of how much people want to save versus spend now. See how beautiful that is? Yeah. Banking theory can be fun. All right. So a good solution for the problem at hand would be for the entire industry to agree to a certain reserve ratio, say 80%. This would cap the maximum risk while giving the exchange a certain flexibility to engage in lending activity. One obvious benefit will be speeding up the circulation and increasing liquidity. Given that not all users have the same risk tolerance, they should be allowed to either opt for a zero interest but full reserve account or a fractional reserve but interest bearing one. Okay, so he gets the difference that you can have zero interest, full reserve account. But if you're talking about Bitcoin, you don't need that. You just hold your own Bitcoins in your wallet. They sit there and they appreciate as more people buy into the system. Duh. If you want to have a system where your Bitcoins are loaned out, you can do that. That's already built into the system. You don't need to impose this artificial concept of a central bank on the Bitcoin system. That's the brilliance of it is that it is bypass all of this old thinking that's based on the racket of a central reserve bank or you know central bank backing up all of these you know overextended fractional reserve systems in exchange with 80% reserve should be well equipped to handle most except the most extreme situations in case the worst case scenario strikes there should be a central bank like institution to step in with the purpose being allowing customers of the exchange to at least recoup a significant portion of their investment now i hate to break it to you but again this is something that the market already provides for but it's not going to be from a central bank like institution it's just called insurance 
This is not to say that the exchanges would go unpunished despite their screw-ups. On the contrary, they should be punished severely and justly, depending on the gravity of their wrongdoings. The penalties can be a fine or getting delisted from the list of recommended exchanges. All this should be decided by a penal, again, really Forbes, thank you, penalty perhaps that is fully representative of the incumbent exchanges as well as users, although the Bitcoin central bank can't create an infinite amount of Bitcoins like the U.S. Federal Reserve. It can at least play a role as a coordinator and guarantor to enable the exchange in trouble to get the much needed funds to survive the crisis of life or death. The benefit of such an institution would be softening the impact of a Gox magnitude meltdown on the entire ecosystem and maintain public confidence in the burgeoning currency. And Mr. Mr. Moo, Eric Moo, uh, I really do appreciate you writing about this and getting an article that is uh, well, well, maybe not well, but thoroughly thought out about Bitcoin onto Forbes. But uh, I, I think as, as we see the Bitcoin market develop, the benefit is going to be that it is going to find this kind of stability. And in fact, it already is in this emerging Bitcoin economy without the perils of a central bank and the great ripoff that it represents. And that's why so many libertarians like myself are driving this new economy forward. And I hope you would take the time to understand that.